Clarita here, and I've got a new sponsor, DistroKid. If you want to release your music into the world, DistroKid's the easiest way to get your music into all the major streaming platforms, unlimited uploads, and keep 100% of your royalties. And because you're a Design Freaks listener, you get 30% off. Go to distrokid.com slash VIP slash Design Freaks. DistroKid. This episode is sponsored by Isotope. Their audio software like RX helps to clean up my recordings, and they have a ton of other products on their site, isotope.com. Right now, Ruinous Media and Fretboard Journal listeners save 10% at checkout on any Isotope plugin or bundle using the code FRET10. Isotope designs award-winning software, plugins, hardware, and mobile apps, powered by the highest quality audio processing, machine learning, and strikingly intuitive interfaces, so you can focus on your craft. So if you have a podcast or produce music, go to isotope.com slash ruinous and save 10% off your order with the code FRET10. Make your audio sound better. Welcome to another episode of the Design Freaks podcast, where we talk about music industry, art and design, and UFOs at the bottom of a pyramid. My name is Clarita, and I am your host. I'm a graphic designer in Seattle, Washington. I'm kind of a vinyl freak, and I love all kinds of music, music packaging, design, and people and stories behind that. So that's what I'm about, exploring all those uh, stories of the overlap of music, art, and design. And I'm so glad you're here listening to episode 39. This is the Tadanori Yokuo episode. So Tadanori Yokuo is one of the best-known Japanese illustrators, painters, and graphic designers of post-war Japan. And he designed a bunch of weird album covers in the 70s, which we're going to talk about. This is a pretty special uh, uh, episode for a couple different reasons. So First, I've been a huge fan of his collage work for a long time, um, but I didn't discover his album art uh, until I found the article that I'm going to be referencing here. Um, I had no idea that he designed album covers until like 2016. And not only did he design records, but uh, probably some of the weirdest and coolest imagery I've ever seen in my life. Uh, he comes in a very close second to Barney Bubbles. I get, I shouldn't compare them. They're just different. But there's a lot of eerie parallels. Um, so I'm going to probably point those out too. But you can see for yourself as well. The second reason that this is a very special episode is that my very, very, very special guest to join me in talking about Tadanori is none other than Professor of Japanese Art and Culture at Harvard University, my sister, Melissa McCormick. So, like I said, she teaches Japanese art history. Uh, she has published books. She guest curated the International Loan Exhibition, The Tale of Genji, a Japanese classic illuminated at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. No big deal. Um, that was from 2019. I got to go to opening night. It was great and got a private tour of the exhibition, um, which was so incredible. Um, I'm brutally simplifying, but the tale of Genji, uh, is an epic sort of saga. There's like ghosts, there's over 200 characters, all kinds of drama and, it's sort of like their epic Game of Thrones. And just to note that the tale of Genji does come up later in the episode. You can see everything she's done, and she even offers a free class through Harvard at uh, edX.org. It's a resource that Harvard actually started um, where you can take free university courses. So I'll have all of her links on my website. Um, and it was such an 
absolute honor to have her on the show. And she not only took the time to chat with me, so, you know, to give context to all this stuff, but also she did her own research on Santana's album Lotus that Tadanori designed in 1974. And that holds the world's record for the most number of gatefolds. So it had 22 gatefolds. And she also ordered the CD version which is a small scale version with all the gatefolds. And she recorded a video like a a frame by frame sort of time lapse of the unfolding. So I'm going to post that. And she's at scholar.harvard.edu slash Melissa McCormick. So yeah, I was going to go over his work like a year ago and I was afraid I wasn't pronouncing things correctly. And I thought, well, I might as well contact Melissa, see if she can help me out a little bit. And not only did she assist me, but She's going to be joining me on the show. Like I said, we ended up collaborating. So really, really cool. Um, And so what I'm going to talk about to lead into that conversation with her is his early life. It's like a snapshot of uh, what led him up to those albums, uh, to those, to designing those record sleeves, which is spoiler, it's the posters. (laughs) Uh, and then I'm going to talk about like his breakout work and work with the Beatles and Cat Stevens. And then I'm going to get into my talk with Melissa about Lotus. But before that, I wanted to say thank you for listening. Um, if you enjoy the show, please share, let others know about it. Uh, and a quick note, thankfully the show is free for you to listen, but it's not free for me to make. So if you want to go to my website, you can hit the donate button. Or you can smash it. I don't know. Whatever you want to do. However you want to do it. Uh, Check out all the photos and links there that accompany this episode. So, for example, all of Tadanori's work, including his crazy animations, and all of Professor Melissa's info, and for all other episodes at designfreakspodcast.com. You can also contact me there and find my socials. I'm at Design Freaks Podcast on Instagram. And for more music-related podcasts on the Ruinous Media Network, check out ruinousmedia.com. So right off the bat, I want to talk about uh, the main source for this episode is an article called The Album Design of Yoko Taranori, and that's by Red Bull Music Academy.com. And they have done some really cool articles on graphic designers, artists, musicians. It's a really excellent uh, resource. Very, very cool. Very well designed, well written, and I always learn a lot. So thank you, Red Bull Music Academy.com. Um, and they noted in their article that all names are presented in the proper Japanese order with family name first and proper name second. So sometimes if I'm quoting that article, uh, you know, the names sometimes switch around, but you'll know who I'm talking about. They also say many of the images, um, and I sourced from those are courtesy of an unknown author behind the Japan-centered blog Pink Tentacle. Um, I don't think that exists anymore, but I had to give it credit. Uh, Okay, my other main source is the book called Tadanori Yokuo, and this is the exhibition catalog published in 2006 for the exhibition at, oh Lord, Fondation Cartier pour l'art contemporain, pardon my French, And this is uh, mostly about his paintings. There's also a really cool interview by Takayo Lida, which I'm going to read from a tiny bit to give some reference. So now I'm introducing you to Japanese designer Tadanori Yokuo. So... He was born in 1936 in Nishiwaki. Uh, That's a city, a small city in Hyogo Prefecture. It's about a three and a half hour train ride from Kyoto. So the article does note that he's alive today. He's still cranking out book designs, posters, photography, and he's had a simultaneous career in painting as well. He grew up in post-war Japan, and this was sort of the crazy backdrop that shaped a lot of the artists and designers. 
So over the span of two decades, um, the emperor's divinity had been absolved. The nation was demilitarized. U.S. military troops had occupied cities there, so that was probably really weird for them. And it definitely comes out in his work. Uh, As a teenager, his ambitions were to someday work at a post office and to paint in his spare time. That's interesting. Um, When I was a kid, I wanted to be an ice cream truck driver. Just saying. Uh, After a number of years designing posters and wrapping paper for the Chamber of Commerce in Nishiwaki, uh, Yokuo moved to Tokyo in 1960 at the age of 24, where he began his career as a stage and graphic designer for theater. Okay, I'm just going to point out stage design. Who else did that? Barney Bubbles. I'm just saying there's a lot of parallels here. Okay, back to Tokyo. This was the epicenter of a cultural whirlwind. Um, At this time, it had a population explosion. There were over 10 million people there. They were preparing to host the 1964 Summer Olympics. But at the same time, there were also violent student protests and riots. That's kind of when Yokuo's practice really took root, and it earned him the reputation for bridging the high and lowbrow, pre- and postmodern, Eastern and Western cultures and uh, challenging conventions, Japanese conventions and art conventions by charging those posters with such intense emotion, um, trailblazing across multiple media. Yoko responded to absurdities of signs and symbols, um, tensions between seemingly opposing worlds, including inner and outer worlds, which I'll talk about, and existential questions of the self to offer works that are humorous, chaotic, and deeply autobiographical. So uh, his poster designs for independent theaters in Tokyo were exceedingly popular and weird. (laughs) Um, And me and Melissa talk about two of them and just very strange take on design Um, as they diverged from the foreshortened and flattened style that, you know, post-World War II Japanese graphic design, that was the convention. He kind of blew some some socks off, um, inspired by early Japanese packaging and printmaking and package design. He, he was also inspired by Chinese ornamentation, um, and his work really stood out. Uh, his first breakout moment was at the Persona Group Exhibition in 1965. Um, his poster was titled, this is the title, Made in Japan, Tadanori Yokuo, Having Reached a Climax at the Age of 29, I Was Dead. So this had the rising sun motif in the background, but it's the, instead of red and white, it's, um, you know, the radial sun stripes, but it's blue and red. So vibrates the, the rising sun being a symbol of Japanese imperialism. He referenced Mount Fuji a lot, bullet trains, Mount Fuji erupting sort of weird eroticism. His childhood photo is at one half of the page and then there's also a class photo um, and there's illustrations drawn over both of them and on the class photo there's a hand with its thumb covered by the index finger which in Japan that's like our when we cross our fingers and behind our back because uh, we're lying or or saying JK. The centerpiece is a cartoon portrait of the designer himself a rose in his hand and he is committing an act of suicide that I don't want to talk. I don't really, you can look at it yourself. I'm not going to post it or talk about it in length. Um, but it's one of his most famous pieces ever and pretty disturbing, even though it's, he's still in his cartoonish phase. Um, one of, uh, so I guess his earliest known record cover is a single for the band, the happenings Four. I love this cover so much. Um, it says uh, in the article, a wildly mediocre lounge influence group sounds banned. <laughs> uh, the record features hand colored photos of the band's members along with pseudo psych lettering. How is it pseudo psych? I don't know. It's pretty psych to me. And a sprinkling of decorative elements. I love it. I love the colors. I love everything. It's weird and pretty. The record covers that he designed in 69 and 70 for Takakura Ken's Deluxe and Fuji Junko's Red Peony Gambler 
both soundtracks to popular film stars records that brought him even further into the Japanese public eye. His designs brought out the appeal of the rogue Yakuza nature of both records. Each featured illustrations of the stars and character, mixing pop colors with Yoko's own deft Japanese calligraphy with gradated colors inspired by traditional Japanese Yukioe printmaking. And one of these picture discs is so funny. He, part of the illustration is the center label off. <laughs> it's a designed la center label, but not in the center. It's like part of the vinyl. Pretty awesome. And then there's another one. He likes to break the fourth wall of design. So there's another one with a hand grabbing the record as part of the record design. Um, Toshi's opera from the works of Tadanori Yoku was a hybrid psych experimental album by Yoko Ono's first husband and former student of John Cage. And it's a double picture disc and it, it's an homage to um, Yoko's early graphic works. And it says here, it's a powerhouse of design and inter wait, indeterminate music. <laughs> I mean, these picture discs are gorgeous. I... Please, somebody send me one of these. I wish I had them. Anyways, that same year, he designed the cover for Kokoro no Uramado. And this is by Asaoka Rurika. And um, she was an immensely popular actress. She acted alongside Japan's most talented actors at that time, including Shishiro Jo, who was perhaps the first actor to have surgically implanted cheeks so that he resembled a squirrel. It says here, um, the album featured a mind blowing bees eye view of Asaoka, one of post-war Japan's greatest sex symbols. And it stands as one of Yoko's greatest graphic works, a singular piece of brutalist collage. I love, this is one of my favorite designs by him. Uh, the central figure is the actress that I mentioned, um, uh, Asaoka, and she is sort of dissected into a million, like the way um, an insect eyes would see into a bunch of cells. I guess kaleidoscopic would be the only way I know how to describe it, but you can see it for yourself. It's kind of cool to see and wonder how he did that. But yeah, there's definitely like Snapchat filters that do that. Also thinking about what was happening graphically at that time, definitely blowing people's minds. Um, let's see. So now we're getting into the seventies and this is when he started designing for big Western rock bands, big international bands like earth, wind and fire, the Beatles, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Cat Stevens, Tangerine dream. That's an amazing one too. Um, you got to look at his discogs. If you look up Tadanori Yokuo, and then click, go down and click on visual work, and it'll show all the albums. I mean, these are incredible. And then you can click through the inserts, the center labels, everything. I mean, just really, really cool, some of these. And there's a lot of UFOs. There's a lot of pyramids happening. Let's see. I'm here for all of it. So yeah, this is where we see how we entered the music scene. So Yoko's poster work helped introduce him to the international music industry, most notably record labels in the U.S. and Europe. And in these posters, he shifted from a hand-wrought illustration style to more collage-oriented, so he got less cartoony. And uh, there's icons of history, geography. Those are juxtaposed with pop stars. Um, and the contextualization of musicians in scenes into scenes in Babylon, Egypt, and just like these wild neon jungles. And it said that it boosted the pop star's gravitas, which it does make everything look more mystical, more meaningful. Um, the Beatles poster is so awesome. Uh, they're levitating over what looks like ruins of ancient temples, maybe Egyptian ruins mixed with the marquee for the star club. And then there's like people everywhere, but it's just this otherworldly place. And it also features his signature red sky, which I want to talk about because a lot of his work, a lot of his poster work and his albums uh, ha have that feature, that signature red sky. 
and I do talk about it with Melissa as well, but I want to read just for a second part of that interview from the uh, exhibition catalog I was talking about earlier because the interview by Takayo Lita talks about the red sky and where that came from. So here the interviewer says, I think you were nine years old at the end of the second war. Could you tell us about how you experienced the war? <laughs> what a question. Tadanori says, when I saw the gold speckled streak left by the bombers over the mountains to the east, I felt like I was living a sublime, almost sacred moment. The sirens announcing the airstrikes made a big impression on me, as well as the scarlet red coloring the sky to the east whenever bombs were dropped on Akashi and Kobe. And then the interviewer says, do you mean that red is linked to images of catastrophe? Tadanori says, under the red tinted sky, there was a massacre going on. Red is the color linked with images of the beyond. It was my first experience of fear triggered by the outside world. And then Takayo Lita asked him this. Imagine asking someone this question. This is so intense. And your first experience of the fear that comes from inside yourself? <laughs> wow. He, and then Tadanori says, my father was a sleepwalker. I mean, how much does that explain? The two worlds colliding, the, the otherworldly with the waking life, conscious world. Um, he says, my father was a sleepwalker. He did it every night. I even saw his face dripping with blood after he accidentally put his head through a window pane. And it only made him tenser when my mother reacted to these incidents. I could say that these scenes from a strange world formed my ex first experience of inner fear. Let's see. So then Takayo says, I don't know if there's any connection to these strange scenes of your father sleepwalking, but many of your works seem to be colored by nocturnal atmosphere. For instance, the series in which three young boys are furtively looking at an en enigmatic object or the series of red paintings. And again, the paintings in which you can only see the children's legs. All these works seem to evoke sleepwalking, an intermediate state between waking and sleeping. And then Tadanori says, it is more like a state of fusion where the borders are not apparent rather than a world divided in two. Basically, I never see things from a dualistic perspective. My way of thinking doesn't revolve around the opposition between, quote, good and evil or, quote, beauty and ugliness, for instance. And then he says that those three boys are in the world of death and they're looking at our reality from there. In short, they're not looking at it from the standpoint of life, but from the other world, that of death. The vision of my sleepwalking father, as well as the war scenes that were imagined but could not see on the other side of the mountain, all that was really, quote, the beyond to me. Wow. So the, the atrocities of the war melded with the other side in his mind. And that's, that explains a lot about his art. There's a lot of red. There's a lot of sort of nightmare f feeling happening. Um, so then Tadanori also says that there's an area in the subconscious that merges with the conscious mind. If you look at these two poles outside modern ways of thinking, then it's true that the source of my inspiration is unconscious and archaic. Um, he says that lately I have many dreams where the border between everyday life and non-everyday life is non-existent. One could say that reality is but an illusion or shadow. For me, the world of true reality lies in the beyond. In my view, each of us should examine his own reason for being. I also think that by seeing my own being as an essential reality, I can find a way of knowing the world. But yeah, this book is incredible. And it ha also has a list. There's tons of monographs out there and essays that Tadanori has written. So it's a great resource to finding out even more. So now we get into, so now that I've explained that, <laughs> uh, we get into his design for Lotus, which was a live album by Santana recorded in Japan. We'll, we're going to talk about that. And then, so, so the record sleeve featured a photograph um, of a reposed Buddha against an illustration of a red lotus. Um, lots of symbols and a photo of the crowd at the live concert. 
with uh, art overlaid. I guess Miles Davis saw the work he did for Santana and the same year he did the design for uh, Miles Davis Agarta double LP. And that was also a live recording in Japan. And he wanted those themes also to be involved. But what's weird is that the album design for Lotus is about mythical subterranean utopia known as Agarta. And Agarta was the name of the album for Miles Davis. Uh, I think it's also known as Hollow Earth. So there's lots of different uh, ancient beliefs about Hollow Earth and it has lots of different names. Yeah, so... Um, there's allusions to the lost city of Atlantis, UFOs, Afrofuturism, and the cover shows two women perched on the edge of a jungle with a megalopolis, like just a giant um, metropolis displayed out, giant city. The gatefold uh, sleeve explains his visuals in detail. Um, during various periods in history, the supermen of Agartha came to the surface of Earth to teach the human race how to live together in peace and save us from wars, catastrophe, and destruction. Uh, we're waiting. <laughs> I think now we would just ignore it. I think, weren't there just UFOs? And everyone was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the apparent sighting of several flying saucers soon after the bombing of Hiroshima may represent one visitation. Interesting. The UFO shown here symbolizes a similar connection. So the one panel shows the women looking out of the jungle to the huge sprawling city. And then the next panel shows um, a UFO. It looks like to me a UFO getting sucked up by a bigger UFO. And then to the side, there's a jellyfish, which looks similar. And then just a ton of underwater and underwater plant life in, in place of where the jungle was. It sounds crazy, but it's gorgeous. Um, so his search for utopias didn't stop there. His next album cover design was for the soundtrack of the popular TV show, Moo. And I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced, M-U, later re, uh, retitled Moo Tribe. And Hiromi Go and Kir Kiki Kirin did uh, some cheesy song for it that became really popular called uh, Rock and Roll of the Ghost, Obake no Rock and Roll. <laughs> and it's really funny. Um, it says here that show was uh, a really banal family drama, but that Yoko, Tadanori Yokuo designed the opening sequence for it. And I'm going to post that. It's nuts. And it shows there's all the same uh, imagery that I'm going to talk about with Lotus, all the uh, pan-religious iconography, the UFOs, the pyramids. There's even, I'm not sure if he was influenced by Storm Thorgerson, but there's the kind of a prism coming out that occurs in a couple, couple different places. Uh, reminiscent of the Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon a little bit, but like kind of taken to another level. Um, and then the next big record pa packaging was for Amigos by Santana. And that was released in 1976. And the imagery continu continues the visual story from the Agarda with a psychedelic Mayan man and woman um, standing on a jungle cliff. And everything is like black light or neon. And there's this black, black void behind them. It's pretty disturbing. I don't know. I don't know why I, I find this imagery so disturbing. On the interior, a pile of angels and fighting animals in muted colors on the edge of a cliff overlooking a blanket of clouds while an abrupt neon sunset sits on the horizon. And then in the very distance, there's a tiny cartoon elephant and a man walking toward the face of a smiling cartoon sun. This thing, it makes you feel like you're on drugs. Seriously, if you look at this long enough. So now we're getting into the album that, and Tadanori was also a musician. And I could be wrong about a couple of these records he designed. He probably performed on them too, but it wasn't totally clear which ones he had only designed. Uh, but anyways, he definitely performed on Cochin Moon. Uh, that was a collaboration between him and Hosono Hiromi or Hiromi Hosono. 
depending on how proper you're being, um, from Yellow Magic Orchestra, of course. And if you're not familiar with Yellow Magic Orchestra, it, they're amazing. So they were sort of like um, a Japanese super group because each of them had already been established musicians in their own right. And they formed in 1978. And it was kind of a concept by Hiromi Hosono. And he played bass, keyboards, and vocals. <clears throat> Yukihiro Takahashi played drums and vocals. And he was my favorite of all of them. He had my favorite solo album called Neuromantic, which I will link to. Kind of a perfect new wave record. And then um, Ryuchi Sakamoto played keyboards and also did vocals. And the group is considered really influential, innovative. Um, they kind of were precursors to, you know, 80s synth pop, electric pop, techno. Um, they use samplers, sequencers, drum machines, computers, all kinds of digital recording, anything and everything. And, you know, they just kind of were way ahead of their time. But not only that, not only were they ahead of J-pop, electro, and all that. But they also were exploring subversive, like, political themes in their song content. So pretty badass on every level. It's interesting that um, Hosono says that it was kind of a one-off exploration of computerized exotica and parody of Western conceptions of the Orient. Anyway, highly recommended. And then there's also an amazing interview with Harumi Hosono, uh, of course, conducted by RedBullMusicAcademy.com that I will link out to. Uh, but getting back to Cochin Moon, Cochin Moon was an experimental electro exotica album, which was meant to sonically illustrate an unreleased Bollywood film. The album was meant to be a collaboration and the duo traveled to India for inspiration, but apparently Hosono wound up having to produce the album solo as Yokuo was the victim of extreme diarrhea during their travels in India and was for the most part confined to the hotel room from which the album took its title. So they stayed at the Cochin Moon and... Ouch. I mean, he could have died. It's pretty serious. So glad he made it out of that Indian trip. Jeez, don't drink the water, folks. So the final installment of Yokuo's idealized alternate futures, sort of the pyramid, UFO, pan-religious theme, was the design for Japanese synthesizer king, Isao Tomita's seminal 1978 album, The Bermuda Triangle. Incredible. Okay, there is a much better resolution photo of this album cover I'm going to be posting. The one in the Red Bull article is a little muted. It's hard, kind of harder to see everything that's happening, but um, plus there's a red background, which I think is a little distracting. Only critique. So I highly recommend you either look at the one that I'm posting or the one on Discogs, but it is incredible. I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm just going to read what it says here because I can't even, I don't even know where to begin. Um, the front cover of the original pressing is bisected diagonally with a looming half moon, half geodesic dome, a collaged gold high heeled foot pressing on the artist's name and a religious icon overlooking the ruins of a Roman forum. The bottom features collaged white folks holding hands, quoting, all looking down on a super, uh, super studio influenced uh, grid, axonometric grid, which I never heard before. And that's overlaid on a landscape. It looks like a diagram of a pyramid. And at the bottom, the bottom cells of the pyramid um, have the lettering inscribed, which reads pyramid sounds. And then there's a Roman column with a Rococo anti-pattern frames on the right side, while the left shows another small cropped landscape with a darkened window pasted on it. And that window over that landscape with the black window panes is probably one of the creepiest things I've ever seen. And this is it's giving me a little bit of hypnosis here too. So I'm wondering 
First of all, did he know Barney Bubbles? Was he familiar with Barney Bubbles' work? They both, if you look at Glastonbury Fair, the pyramids, the, you know, I mean, it was the zeitgeist of the time, but if you look at these exact themes of the collaging of the religions and everything, it's um, like with Barney Bubbles' first record, Quintessence, a lot of similarities. And then also with hypnosis at the time with the disturbing nightmare collages. So anyway, a lot to think about um, what was going on. It reminds me of that Repo Man quote, and that movie's from the 80s, but uh, one of the characters says, have you noticed that everyone's into weirdness? (laughs) This was one of those times, everyone, you know, and then later in the 80s, it was like, alien abductions, communion, all that stuff. So anyway, um, something to think about. So I love this last part of the article. I couldn't have written this any better. It says, uh, it is Yokuo's body of work showing inner worlds that is perhaps his greatest gift to culture to show that the real way out is to go in designing records that showed us as much of his dreams as they did of himself. And this article, I didn't even credit the author, was written by none other than Ian Lynham. So thank you, Ian, for that work. Um, So one final thing to bring us full circle and also bring us into my talk with Melissa is this record cover I was just describing by Isao Tomita called the Bermuda Triangle is from 1978. But guess what he did in the year 2000? That's right the tale of genji okay um actually he did the tale of genji in 1999 and then in the year 2000 he released the tale of genji symphonic fantasy so it all hakuna matata is all around and um yeah pretty fascinating stuff as usual only scratch the surface the rest is up to you if you want to keep reading give it a goog now enjoy this chat with my sister, a professor of Japanese art and culture at Harvard University, Professor Melissa. Clarita, great. Hi, hi, Melissa. Good. Glad to hear it. And thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. It's such a pleasure. Oh, my goodness. I feel so lucky to have an art professor here to talk about <laughs> the subject today. Um, how do you introduce yourself to, say, an, a new audience like this? I usually just say, uh, so I'm Melissa McCormick. I teach Japanese art at Harvard University, and I tend to specialize in Japanese art from before 1900, but I teach everything. Happy to be here. I'm so excited to talk about Tadanori. So will you tell my listeners the correct pronunciation of his name? Sure. So he's uh, someone who works primarily in Japan. I think we tend to talk about him with his last name first, and his last name is Yoko-o. So there's two characters that make up his last name. The first one is pronounced Yoko, and the second one is pronounced O. And so then you say his last name, Yoko-o. And his first name is Tadanori. And so you've lived in Japan. You're obviously a Japanese art professor and researcher, historian. And so... When you're in Japan, how popular is he? Is he more, uh, is he more like pop culture there than here? Because I, people don't really know him except for designers here. Right. Yes. Yeah. So he's definitely an important cultural figure and a kind of uh, television personality, kind of um, a personality who's in the public eye quite a bit. He has a. I think he still has. Maybe he's. Um, 
stop this recently, but a regular column in one of the major newspapers where he kind of just opines on various cultural matters. He's got so many publications in addition to all of the artwork that he's done, um, more than one museum dedicated to his work. And I just actually saw just the other day, he was giving a presentation with his daughter, who's also an artist, on an installation of an artwork that she had done for the Olympics, so just this month. Uh, So he's still going strong. Um, It's pretty incredible. So lots of like interviews of him online. He's been a kind of cultural presence for, for decades. Wow. Yeah, the the Olympics are there right now. Um, that's so interesting. Right, which is interesting timing because some of the things that I think we'll touch on today have to do with that moment in around 1964 when Tokyo was hosting the Olympics in the summer of that year. Yep, great design too for that. I won't ask you what you think about this year's. <laughs> yeah, the logo is interesting. There was a bit of a controversy about that, but... It all got hammered out. Uh, let's see. Oh, because it was supposed to be 2020. Uh, but the checker pattern, I kind of like it. Um, and there are different configurations of that. I think it's the geometrical design is pretty cool. Let me see. Oh, yeah. I like the I like the checker. It's uh, There's a really fun and um, innovative spirit when it comes to Japan and the Olympics that I like. Um but uh, so his daughter, so did you know who his daughter was already? Okay, so they're actually together creating one of the biggest m- murals ever for the, um, for the, for the Olympics. So Tadanori wow. Yoko and his daughter Mimi Yoko. Um, so the murals will appear on two Tokyo skyscrapers. <gasps> Whoa. So I wonder if it's going to look like his work at all. Oh, I think it's, um, well, I think it should be, you should be able to find some photographs online. Mm-hmm. Um, they were just unveiled this month and they're going to be on display until September 5th. Oh, neat. Let's go full circle and start probably before she was born um, in 1960. <laughs> Where do we begin? 66? Sure. Yeah. Um Oh, I'd love to start talking about the Koshimaki Osen poster from 1966 with the peach in the center, um, which he did for one of the underground theater performances that he was involved in in the 60s. Um, Koshimaki Osen, it's, so it's in uh, uh, Romanized Roman letters at the top of the poster, and it's the name of a play um, that was being um, staged by this playwright and his group and um, his name was Karajuro and he was a close kind of collaborator with Taranori. He asked Taranori to be um, involved in a lot of his activities and it was one of these um, what was called Angura in Japanese these underground theater groups in the 60s and they would stage kind of street performances, kind of pop art performances. So here he is working for these theaters. He's creating these amazing posters um, and there's so much detail. I think maybe even more interesting is how the poster responds to um, the task at hand, which was to kind of comment on the play. And I mean, maybe not the specific content of the particular play, but the kind of um, stance of the those who were staging these performances and plays. Um, he has embedded into the posters this kind of square. I think you can see in the center of the poster, sort of just off to the right, is a black bordered um, white square that has a lot of text, vertical Japanese text with a red peony in, in the le- lower left corner. And then the text is around that. And that's essentially a kind of a statement about what the playwright and the group is doing on the part of uh, of Yoko Taranori, who's really promoting this work and saying that, you know, he's, um, you know, revolutionizing theater. He's going against this kind of traditional conventional mode. He is um, 
incorporating things from the past, which was something that was important in his own artwork, but going back to pre-1900 Japan during what's called the Edo period, which is this time uh, roughly 300 years from around 1615 to 1868. Um, where Japan was ruled by the Tokugawa shogunate. But that's really the beginning of the Edo period marks, the beginning of a real print boom. And so you get just an explosion of visual media in the print print form, all kinds of books and all sorts of um, broadsheets, ukiyo-e. This is the era of ukiyo-e, essentially. Um, and so he's talking about sort of going back to past forms, traditional forms of Japanese art and culture. And he mentions in this text, actually, even beyond the Edo, the Kamakura period and some kind of ancient um, folk tales that are called Otogi Zoshi. He mentions those and how um, this playwright is actually tapping into that and to kind of um, using kind of eternal universal themes in the work um, and yet making it vibrant and modern. Um, and it's a kind of anti-modernism in a way um, and sort of using these pre-modern forms to do that and um, positioning Japan sort of, um, it has this kind of wealth of resources to use that's not Eurocentric, not Euro-American um, and that can create something kind of just altogether alternative. Um, so he sort of says, goes out and says that that's what the playwright's doing. And then in the print itself, he does that by using, for example, um, maybe you want to describe the, the print Clarita, just oh my gosh. You know, what it looks like. It is so cool. I cannot stop looking at it. His work. Um, the amazing thing about his work is there's always a really strong, stable symmetry that grounds you when you start looking at it and then your eye can start to notice these things that break the grid and uh, the, the asymmetrical uh, aspects of it. Um, they really stand out. There's curled up paper. There's um, mm -hmm. the rising sun motif, which is in a lot of his work. Um, it looks like um, a parachute, the nude parachute um, figure. Uh, the woman at the top who's multiplied and going into the sun. Um, uh, overall, or coming it's, out of the sun. Coming um, out of yeah, the she's sun. got this fighter pilot um, helmet on, and she's yeah multiplied as you said. This naked pink body with these kind of swirling gold clouds wrapped around her middle area, I guess, that are kind of like traditional clouds from that kind of signal the supernatural in older forms of Japanese art. Um, but her helmet says basically like the theatrical roadshow. Um, <laughs> but and she's got her mouth open, but it's, it's sort of, it's interesting because she is like taking the place of a fighter jet and the rising sun, the, the, the radial sun that's used here is one that was used in a kind of the Japanese military flag during the war. Um, but you see that again and again in, in his work. Um, and what's interesting too, is you see that actually in his, his animation. So he has a couple of um, early animations that you can see on YouTube and that form of the, the radiating sun Yes, it's the flag, but it also kind of morphs into other things like halos and um, sort of crown-like shapes when you see it in that animated form. And so you see that kind of helps to think, see how his mind is working a little bit. Um, yeah, the pink is really arresting. <laughs> um, and it's like, so it's the peach, it's the, the, the multiple bodies of the woman. And then there's these kind of um, the border on the right and left are that bright pink. And then there's red as a kind of base color in the center. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting. Yeah, the peach that you mentioned is giant and it's kind of evocative of some folk tales about Momotaro, the peach boy. Um, but it's, it's interesting, peach? like... Is that um, <laughs> along the same lines, perhaps wow. um, <laughs> a little different. Okay. Um, but um, Beach boy. yeah. So the waves, um, I guess, you know, you would say that they uh, are referencing Hokusai's great wave in the way that they curl, mm -hmm. they're sort of monumental and they curl around. Um, but they're actually a kind of stylized, rendition of the of Hokusai's mm. Great Wave, which is um, from a print series that was all about not the wave, but about Mount Fuji. 
And so what Hokusai was doing in that famous print series was showing all the different ways, 36 ways of seeing Mount Fuji, Fuji through different lenses, different landscapes, um, different um, sites. And instead of, so in the original print, what you would find is a tiny triangle of Fuji framed by the wave. But here he, he duplicates the wave. So he puts it, you know, on either side. And instead of Fuji in the middle, there's that giant peach. Um, and Fuji is, the Fuji mountain is, of course, kind of a symbol of Japan. So instead you have the, the peach replaced there with the Shinkansen, ah. sort of in its stem area. Um, but the way, yeah, he sort of takes the the waves and um, takes them out of context and reduces them to just that single primary blue color. And then um, and then he kind of it's almost like thinking about the printing process and duplication, the way he mirrors the the wave on either side and frames the object in the center. But the Shinkansen, too, is interesting because this was made in 66. The Shinkansen wasn't created it didn't wasn't unveiled until 1964 so just two years before and that was at done in time to um coincide with the olympics oh i see oh wow so it's really timely for this this particular print um but then underneath all that so that very kind of um bright colored the objects and so forth the wave and the peach is over this like newspaper image mm-hmm. of two men confronting each other. It's kind of open-ended what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. I tend to see, it sort of looks to me like they're about to engage in a kind of fight. Or, (laughs) because one of them is naked to me, or he's talking. Oh, really? I think, and his his lips are the same pink as the peach. The bright pink. So they look half-tone, uh, newspaper like almost xeroxed and then he's got those bright pink lips and it, to me it looks like he's not wearing a shirt but i don't know i i think that he, i can see a collar in one of oh, the, the I see. details yeah, yeah. <laughs> i see yeah. but the other one um the other figure is the man with a kind of suit coat on and all um, like a bowler hat or mm-hmm. it's not a, quite a top hat Look. but a really really formal attire and we just see the back of his head um but then there's a little tiny bit of writing that's on a white ray of the sun that's coming out of his hat. What does and it say? <laughs> it says in Japanese, um, this is a photograph, a photograph by Hosoe Eiko, um, who was a really incredible photographer uh, who did um, images and portraits of the writer Yukio Mishima. Mm-hmm. And he um, also did um, uh, a lot of work with the Buto um, theater troupe at the time, mm-hmm. by uh, run by Hijikata. And mm-hmm. so he's a really important avant-garde photographer. Um, he has this great work of Mishima called um, Barake, um, sort of... Uh, death by roses in english and yeah. you can probably see some examples online if you look up um Hosoe Eiko. and he has four exclamation points after he says that in japanese um and so it's like sort of a uh, bragging a bit like look on this poster i've even got a photograph by Hosoe one of these important players in this whole artistic um, activity that's going on around him. But uh, it's kind of interesting too, that little voice he puts in there, yelling out at the viewer, right? Like, look at this, you know, it's kind of interesting that he's becomes a narrator in his designs Mm -hmm. in some of these poster designs. So there's this kind of um, a sense of like addressing the viewer very literally with these, Mm -hmm. with the words Um, like even in that manifesto that he has here um in that that long piece of text about the play he um really writes it from his point of view addressing the the person who's looking at the poster Mm -hmm. and then another little interesting thing here is in the um in the lower um right corner you you mentioned how it kind of shows the paper in the print Mm -hmm. curling up it's like this kind of weird play right this kind of self-referential 
Yeah. Yeah. And it has, it's a little photograph of the playwright actually. Oh. And he puts a, he puts his name there and he puts an arrow pointing to him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, this person is Karajuro. And then he has that little photo of him in red. Um, and then below there's a, just a straight on um, advertisement for a cafe in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> A cafe where you can listen to classical music. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it gives its address and phone number. So I guess it's, um, you know, like maybe paying, helping to pay for the poster, right? It's advertising. Interesting. Wow. Yeah. And so he'll do that kind of thing again and again, like sort of bring in um, even more kind of like visually compelling little advertisements and put them into his his artwork. I yeah. Like, I mean, there's a lot going on. <laughs> there's a whole lot going on, but I love that. That's the same thing Barney Bubbles did was he took away that central figure and he created kind of a shotgun blast, a whole, he used the whole canvas just like this, where people mm-hmm. could travel, their eyes could travel around and there was lots to do and see. Um, and it creates a world, not just one central image. So. Yeah, I mean, there's so much information contained in there in terms of just informing the viewer about what's um, what the play and the staging is about and all that. So it's almost not not really a poster, right? It, it's it's mm-hmm. um, it's more of a kind of um, document for the troupe in some ways. It's a kind of um, statement of purpose. Yeah. And one that aligns really visually as well as kind of in terms of content with what they wanted to do. Yeah, it's so um, perfect. But, so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. It, and even though, like, as you said, it's got all that going on with a, like a little map and addresses and names of the artists and or the actors. Um, it was one of these works that was collected by MoMA, right? So yep. surprisingly, very early on, he has the stature as an artist whose works are in that, you know, temple of modern art from really early on. So he goes to New York in 1967 and um, meets a bunch of graphic designers, gets exposed to psychedelic art, Mm -hmm. um, really expands his, his worldview, I think. um, And then comes back to Japan and um, continues doing so many different things. Um, So there's just a tremendous amount of kind of collaboration and interdisciplinary stuff going on. Like he works with, you know, um, musicians and artists, and he was in charge of um, directing the creation of the textile pavilion for the 1970 Osaka Expo, which was a big deal. So, um, he doesn't really do one thing or have kind of one medium even does some uh installation work right later Mm -hmm. on um so there's another poster here for the rose colored dance um this is really cool too it's kind of spooky like with the other figures um is there the same amount going on is this another play Oh, so this was for um, the performance, a Buto performance um, by uh, Hijikata, who um, is probably like the um, most important uh, Buto figure in Japan. And um, that was something that um, Taranori did. And then that was actually um, seen by Karajudo. And then that enabled him to sort of start working on these other posters. Um, But yeah, so he takes a kind of Western um, art piece from the 16th century, these two women, right? Um, And repurposes that, removes their faces, uses his uh, Japanese radiating flag again in the center and then in the corners and then uses a kind of, um, you would know the font that he's using here for the, the Roman the Roman text. I don't know what the name of it is, but I rec- it's a curly Q serif font that's very decorative. Um, and he uses it on a on a shear or a slant. Uh, it's pretty cool. Yeah. 
So I guess one of the things that he's doing, and he, he has said this, is that he was kind of really going against the grain of, of modernism at the time, introducing so many kitsch elements into his work and decorative elements that, that were sort of, you know, just anathema to the high modernists. Mm. I love it. It's a beautiful middle finger that he created. <laughs> but I but I'm also noticing one of the figures looks to be squirting the other one's breast milk onto her face. Just thought mm. I'd point that out. And then the other <laughs> one has her hand in a cake down below. Like there's frosting on her hand and her face is the color of the frosting. So <laughs> uh maybe that has a statement about um traditional female roles, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different things going on. Eroticism, death, mm -hmm. big themes in his work. Mm -hmm. And then the train at the top this time. Ah. It looks like it's like heavenly coming out of some clouds or something. And then the, and then the two waves again. Right. And three suns. Wow. Right, okay. yeah. And the suns at the bottom almost look like fan ribs oh you're right but they are sons yeah um so then you know he has so much uh work behind him when he starts to do the the album covers for some of the these foreign bands and artists that are visiting japan santana 1970 1974 the album came out lotus that he did for um the tour um the live recording of Santana's tour in 1973. Can we just talk really quick before we get to that about mm -hmm. the word image poster from 1968? Um, because I saw the other day and it was being an ad that was targeted towards me, mm -hmm. uh, a bathing suit with the eyeball on it, an exact replica. And I've seen this imagery a lot of places and mm -hmm. everywhere on Pinterest. People rip it off all the time. Um, the multiple open mouths, the color story, the whole thing, the strong black, you know, background or outlines. But um, he's never credited. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's like a Keith Herring sort of thing where it just belongs to the world now, but he's still alive. I think you have a different algorithm. Okay. Than I do. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, the, the, and that the museum chose to use this as the poster for the exhibition, right? Which was about many different graphic designers, not just him. He was just, you know, one part of it, um, which was, uh, you know, interesting. Um, and again, you have sort of the, the radial sun imagery, but this time the eye is in the center. Mm -hmm. The blue eye which could be just yeah. color, color choice. But anyway, I love the image. It's really strong. And that's why people have ripped it off and taken it so many times. I wonder how he feels about that, the commercialism or the all the merchandising mm -hmm. that's done with his stolen imagery. I just, I'm so curious about that because he is still alive. But anyway, I just, that's a little side note um, because it is so ubiquitous. And I've done it too. I made buttons out of the eye. I, you know, oh. <laughs> I, have one, I have one on my jacket right now. Um, but I know who he is. Like if someone said, what's that? I could tell them. I wonder if it's sort of the museum's property since it was done for mm. the show. You're right. Um, you know, he's, he does have his own commercial, uh, outlets. He works with the designer Issa Miyake, for example, to do all sorts of clothing designs. Mm. So that's a kind of, he does have kind of income streams through those kinds of commercial products as well. So we were going to talk about Lotus. It's a three record LP with, it looks yeah. like mul multiple inserts and a booklet. Um, and photographs of the band and then it looks like the cd came with even more yeah they because they did the i don't know if the original lp it couldn't have had such just extensive liner notes as the cd so the the cd came out in um 2006 so it's like the deluxe version 
Yeah, and a complete you know, like miniature version of the vinyl I love so that it. you can experience all the gatefolds. Oh my God, it's so cool. Tell me about when they met and how this happened or whatever, however you want to explain it. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought Lotus would be a good way to, to talk about some of his album cover art. And also it's so different than what you see in the 60s poster art. He's really kind of, it shows him in a new face of um, creative uh, art making and a new kind of uh, philosophy and kind of spirituality to his work. And it's a new zeitgeist in the 70s, essentially, um, as everyone knows. Um, he also had like a pretty severe uh, accident where he was incapacitated for quite a while and then came back from that. Um, so he was in a very different place, I think, in the in the 70s. And um, he, a uh, super famous designer by 1973 when Santana tours Japan. I mean, he's already, you know, been to New York. He's been, had a gallery show. He's been collected by MoMA. He's like got worldwide recognition as a designer. Um, and then, you know, rock bands are, touring Japan pretty frequently at this time. You know, have the Beatles who came in 1966 and ever since then, you know, post-war Japan is like full of um, really important rock concerts. And um, they had, I guess, an excellent recording of the band Chicago um, before Santana came. And I think that encouraged um, the kind of recording of, of the Santana album um, to commemorate their tour. So Santana came in 73 and for over two weeks and they recorded for two days in, in Osaka at this famous um, venue called the Osaka Kose Nenking Hall. Um, not as famous as the, the Budokan in, in Tokyo, which again was a building built for the 64 Olympics. <laughs> that's the Beatles played. I mean, all, everybody's played there and that's, I guess, you know, it's a, it's a great concert hall. Um, but Budokan is literally like, um, uh, martial arts hall because it was made for that purpose for the Olympics. But anyway, so they um, they record Santana over two days in in Osaka, and according to everybody, these are like fantastic recordings, like just really incredible quality. And um, at that point, Santana is like one of the biggest rock bands in the world. Um, they had released um, their album Welcome and Santana and Welcome, and you know the Oya Komova and Black Magic Woman are, you know, hits, right? And also they had done Woodstock. And so that's just incredible, you know, recognition from that. So so it's an incredibly successful tour. While they're there, um, the Sony executive, Sony Japan, um, brings Carlos Santana to meet Yoko Taranori and brings um, Carlos Santana to his studio. And so they have a meeting and they really hit it off. Um, at that point, like Carlos Santana has a guru and um, Yoko Taranori is really kind of interested in spiritual matters. He will in the like following year, um, he writes a book about his various Zen meditation practice because he's pretty serious about it. Um, so they're kind of on the same page and they really hit it off. And, um, and the Sony exec says, um, how about if I ask Taranori to design the, the jacket for the live album? And Carlos Satana was really excited about that. Um, and so they get to work and, um, uh, Yoko has an assistant by the name of Tajima, um, Terohisa who has a lot of recollections about this whole process, which is interesting, but the album is incredible and it's worth talking about because, um, you know, it still holds the world's record for largest number of gatefolds, <laughs> which is uh, 22 in this case. Wow. Um, and so <laughs> the act of unfolding the album is sort of, you know, the act of going through, walking through, traversing into kind of different worlds. And that was, Apparently, one of the goals that um, Taranori, Yoko Taranori had in mind and communicated to his his young 22-year-old assistant when they set out to do this. Um, but in terms of like the design problem and just kind of the, the artistic elements of the album, that's pretty fun to explore too. Um, he uses at this point, so 
you know, where you had the Japanese flag and and kind of like traditional Japanese motifs in the posters that we were talking about. This is a little different. Um, it seems much more trying to go for a kind of universal aesthetic, a kind of um, pan religious universal kind of religious approach to all sorts of iconography from different world religions. But um, there's something that's especially kind of Pan-Asian about it. He uses references to Buddhism, to Hinduism. um, And that's kind of interesting, but I guess as a design problem, then how do you make this thing cohere across 22 separate surfaces? (laughs) Wow. I mean, what an ambitious undertaking. And so I wonder what that meeting was like. Yeah, apparently, um, according to the the Sony exec who introduced them, um, you know, they talked for like over an hour, even though they couldn't understand each other's language. (laughs) A lot of uh, gesticulating, no doubt. It was a great photo of them in um, Yoko's studio, actually, um, in the liner notes. And um you see them sitting side by side and um there's a artwork on the wall there's a picture of george harrison (laughs) and between them between their heads is this big poster and i notice that at the bottom it says jesus christ and it's actually the same image of jesus that you find when you open the album um so Lotus uh, begins with the kind of black cover. It's completely black, like 30, um, you know, in the original vinyl, like 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters square album, right? Um, all black except for this central image of the Buddha. And then the Santana Lotus, those two words in each corner, each of the four corners on a diagonal on the surface cover, right? Um, and then on the back of the album is... Um, uh, an Indian sarasa print. I thought just that full bleed. Yeah. yeah, no, it's you know one of these beautiful um, cotton prints and um, a very uncharacteristic, right? We, we talked about the busyness of his of his uh, posters, but this is like really understated. Um, and I think that gets to kind of the aesthetic that he's moving into with this work. And um, so you have a very um, meditative Buddha in the center of the cover. And it's the Dainichi, which is um, the central cosmic Buddha of esoteric Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And it's an image of a Japanese wooden sculpture that he's using. But um, so that it's not looking just like pure religious art, he superimposes over that, these like uh, kind of multicolored orbs. Um, So three orbs of different sizes, just on top of that Buddha, which is interesting. It's like his, that's his, his process right, of kind of collage and super um, imposing of things to take them out of the realm of the straightforward and kind of one dimension, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But then you open, um, when you open the album, the first thing that you see in that double spread is a photograph of the concert and a kind of large aerial Uh shot of the entire venue. Um, which is nice. And it's also um, strange that everyone's sitting down politely and watching Santana. Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. Um, they look very uh, sedate, but um, it's interesting because the band's on stage, the lights are up so you can see everyone really clearly in the photograph. Um, the band members have instruments in their hands, but they're not really playing it seems. So um, as far as I can tell, it's a small photograph, but um this might be, well, there's a moment when apparently at this concert, they were celebrating the drummer Michael Shreve's birthday um, at the request of the band members and, and the staff. Um, and in the photo, you can actually see some happy birthday banners that are hanging from the upper tier seats. And they actually released ping pong balls into the crowd. <laughs> And this was all to surprise the drummer, right? So um, I guess there are various moments when they could have had the lights up and people were sort of, you know, just sitting in their seats. Um, another interesting thing, the album, if you listen to the album, there's actually an announcement at the start of the concert that they're going to have a one minute silent meditation. Mm. And it's not, it's actually cut out of the Spotify version of Lotus, mm-hmm. but in the original album, 
it's retained. And so you hear that full minute of just silence. Wow. It's an interesting way to start a rock concert. You're getting people like into this other mindset. And it kind of reminds me of the way some of the people who worked on the album in Japan were um, talking about their reaction to Carlos Santana. They were expecting like this Woodstock figure, right? And how he mm-hmm. looked then. But when you showed up in Japan, he his hair was cut short, his mustache was neatly trimmed, he was wearing all white. He had um, a button with a picture of his guru. On, on it and wow. he, according to some he just he looked like a, a very spiritual man which he kind of was he was a vegetarian and there's one guy who recounts like um going to a restaurant in Bopongi in tokyo with tadanori and the album producer and how um he ordered tofu steak so he was a very different kind of carlos santana than i think the image they got from what's up but um it shows how they really constructed the 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 concert that way as well, like had that ethos in the way they presented their music as first clearing the mind, preparing Mm -hmm. everyone for a kind of spiritual experience to get into Mm -hmm. the zone. Um, And it's interesting to think about the power of of that moment, of that minute, right? Mm. That many people all at once. Just it's, It's also, I think, good to always think about how the content of the music might relate to the album design. And at least in some of Taranori's other works he actually did you know listen mention clearly listening to the music and then designing um and so for the lotus album in addition to that minute of meditation the concert starts with this beautiful song composed um or um, arranged by alice coltrane wow going home okay um, which is a a, such a it's a sweet song apparently played at her funeral and um, i just wanted to tell your listeners to to go out and listen to alice coltrane and um, listen to her version of going home and to see the difference um but it's a time when you know um carlos santana and alice coltrane were collaborating you know even today um Carlos will always mention the importance of Coltrane, John Coltrane's mm-hmm. love supreme. Mm-hmm. But he had great respect, obviously, for, for Alice, who's just a musical genius. So it's very, very cool that I think her her um, piece is included first on this album. That particular photo, was there something else we wanted to say? Yeah, we could talk about how he kind of overlays design elements on top of the photo. But yeah, over this photograph, and it takes up two of the surfaces of the of the album as you open it. Um, he has like some golden birds flying. I think they're eagles. Um, and then he puts this image of the lotus flower with a, a blue kind of radiating orb on top of it and um there's a kind of projector light and this is a little bit in the weeds here (laughs) there's a there's a projector light in the far distance from this in the in the concert venue that's illuminating the stage Mm -hmm. and he puts the that lotus as though it's kind of floating on that ray of light oh it's so weird it's smart right um but then so the the album is constructed so that you can you open up the photograph Uh and so then you'll get like a horizontal spread of um one two three four um five surfaces Mm. like one long horizontal oh i see yeah it's it's hard to imagine Mm -hmm. if you don't see it but um in the very center is a golden buddha and then that's a whole surface unto itself. And then um, to the right of that is a, another separate square with um, Jesus's image, mm-hmm. just a headshot. And then um, on the other side of the Buddha is the, an image of Krishna. And the and Jesus the, is from that painting. From yeah, the, the Jesus yeah. is from the, the poster that was hanging <laughs> um, behind them when they when Carlos and, and Taranori first met. Um He's Which, very and Italian it turns out to looking. be, yeah, it turns out to be an Italian painting yeah. um, by the female artist, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi, wow. which is interesting. Um, and then there's this kind of like, um, what would you say, like crimson colored 
sunset, mm-hmm. almost magenta sky. God, it almost and... looks like Armageddon a little bit. Like yeah. how it looks up here when there's a lot of smoke, like a lot of wildfires. The sky looks red like that. It's super spooky. But it doesn't yeah, look it... like a sunset. It looks red. Mm. Yeah, it's probably not supposed to be a sunset. It's just otherworldly. Yeah. And you see the gold lines that he mm-hmm. puts um, radiating outward from, from the Buddha. Yes. Um, I'm not sure exactly how he did that in terms of process, mm-hmm. um, but it is reminiscent of the, the radiating sun mm-hmm. that you see in his posters that we looked at. And then there are these um, snow-covered mountains and kind of silhouetted mountains in the very bottom, like in the sort of foreground. And then you have the, the three deities mm-hmm. and a hand emerging from the bottom, holding a pink lotus flower, mm-hmm. that is which is probably the hand of, of Radha, the consort of, Krish, of Krishna. Oh, okay. And then, so the, then the outermost flaps, which are kind of inserted into the, um, into the album as separate pieces. They're sort of movable parts to the album. They consist of um, wings, essentially, that fold in and, and on top of each other so that you have, you know, these extra surfaces to play with. Um, but he makes one sort of on the theme of the triangle and on the other side to the, to the right of Jesus, that whole wing of the album on the theme of the circle, which is kind of, you know, nice way to kind of have everything cohere yeah but then you can unfold those well there's a picture of the the pyramids at Giza and then you fold that up and then there's an image a kind of um diagram of the inside of the pyramid the great pyramid with the UFO at the bottom um and then if you open those there's this really long vertical image that has the crucifixion um, these what are called uh, daigo images of the bodhisattvas Kannon and Seishi in Japanese Buddhist from a Japanese Buddhist painting coming down to greet a dying uh, person, and then you have Christian imagery at the bottom. Oh, there is a lot going on. Oh, yeah, I was thinking the the Annunciation that's here. I was wondering if that wasn't perhaps a reference to the Abraxas album cover of Santana, um, which was a pretty well-known cover that he was maybe referencing a previous album because it has a a version of the Annunciation um, on that cover. You know, it shows, like, a lot of this has to do with pleasing the client. I think that was in their consciousness, and and Taranori even said to his assistant, like, I I want them to really have their minds blown when they open this up as they unfold it, you know. Um, But in terms of, like, going back to maybe some of the the themes of his work in terms of introducing commercial design elements, even here in this kind of very otherworldly space that he's created, there are these borders at the top and the bottom, these kind of a sliver of a horizontal border that has what he he takes from Indian incense wrappers. (laughs) So a a purely commercial product, a kind of um, box that has images of the sun and palm trees and even like um, the name of the brand of incense. And he, he puts that to kind of enclose the edges of this side of the album. I love it. So pretty interesting. And then I guess also stunning is when you pull out those wings of the album, you see the Santana plane and it's got a, uh, in the, against the blue sky and it's got a UFO hovering on top of the, the cockpit. <laughs> Oh, he does have a UFO hovering over. <gasps> How yeah, so the, the young 22-year-old assistant says that when he first met um, Taranori, he talked for hours, Taranori talked for hours about the occult. And he, you know, UFOs and this kind of thing. So he was really preoccupied with these types of issues in, in the early 70s, as were a lot of people. And um there's even a book by Taranori. He talks about his Zen practice and he was reading a book called Pyramid Power. It's part of the zeitgeist, I guess. Yeah, no, a lot of people were into pyramids and uh, supernatural, uh, new age stuff, uh, mysticism, uh, like you said, pan-religious iconography, 
And perhaps mm -hmm. Chad and Ori was part of uh, establishing that trend or, you know, part of one of, or maybe one of the leaders um, in yeah. Japan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, the theme, uh, back to the theme of sort of just collaboration, cross-fertilization, um, that seems totally plausible. Um, he had done, I think one really important artwork that's related to this album is um, some prints that are in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, actually, by, by Tara Nori, and they're on the theme of Shambhala, which is this mythical place um beyond the mountains and it can relate to this idea of the hollow earth there's several myths and um you know in different traditions about there being paradisal or different kinds of realms in in the earth the earth being um a place where people can flee there are different you know these stories about civilizations having fled an apocalyptic event on the surface of the earth um and creating these alternative it's worlds. It's nature's within. bunker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And also a metaphor for going, you know, deep into the inner self, that ah. sort of thing. He has like a whole kind of statement about Shambhala and then um, many different prints with many of the same kind of themes that he uses for Lotus. Mm. Um, even the Indian uh, incense wrappers come into play. I just, so, I love that he collages that part of commerce into it. Like exactly, commercialized yeah, religion. It, I love it too. It, it's just, um, it makes it so kind of multidimensional and visually compelling. To me, that's the trippiest part because when you are experiencing like ego death or a psychedelic experience, you have one foot in what we call reality. You have, you know, your psyche can do more than one thing. And so to have those yeah. layers present visually like that, it really does create that vibe. And then also even like the design challenge of finding an object. So like a found piece of art that's going to fit perfectly with the kind of composition that he's manufacturing by hand. And there's that nice kind of tension or just, um, you know, complementarity of like the handmade and then the introduced already found object. Miles Davis album um, Argata is interesting just because it is um, another one that touches upon the whole hollow earth theory and Tara Nori did that album and then has even a, a clear statement about what he what he was thinking in terms of introducing the um, some of the design elements like the UFO and um, and his ideas about the hollow earth so it wasn't just for Santana, but this is then um, starting to impact, you know, different. So I guess, you know, the, the thing is like, we're only just scratching the surface of Yoko Taranori. There's so much, you know, the, all the other decades that he's been active. Um, but this is a pretty fun couple of decades to delve into the 60s and 70s. Yeah, it's just a snapshot, folks, but it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty cool. One, and it's all, you know, there's some great album covers that I had never seen before, even though I was familiar with his posters. Thank you so much for talking to me. What would you like people to know? If anyone wants to know more about the work on traditional Japanese art that I do, I have a free course on edX oh. called uh, the book in japan um you can take courses for harvard courses for free all, all sorts of university courses for free so it's self-paced and um people can jump ahead to different modules and it's all free so they can skip the assignments and all of that oh, wow. um and just look at the videos it, i go through all the various book-related collections um, in the Harvard Library and Museum. The last module is uh, kind of relevant for, for what we were talking about with his posters and prints, just because um, 
I look at a book in detail that we have in our library here, and it, it does all some of the interesting things that Taranori does in terms of like paper that's rolling back on itself and like gesturing to the reader, breaking the fourth wall, that kind of thing. And it does it like early, pre 1900. So, Whoa. yeah, Harvard started this as a way, those kind of, you know, nonprofit learning, online learning MOOCs. Um, you can pay for a certificate, um, but it's totally optional. And they actually recently just sold edX to a company, a third party company. Um, so things might change with it, but for now, it's a great resource, I think. It's a lot of wow. fun. Um, the first module, like I, I mean, I'm just telling you this now. <laughs> like yeah. I go into the museum with the curator and we look at the all the old ancient some of the oldest Japanese books in the world uh-huh. that were hidden inside a sculpture that we own. Whoa. It's really fun. Wow. It's great footage. You would never see this stuff in the museum. Okay, I'm signing um, up. And then the other thing is like my Genji book. Like I don't mind promoting that. I'm tr- I, I I was hoping that would um, go into a paper bread printing, but it never did. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's let's say it. Got, uh, the Tale of Genji by my visual Martin. companion. And there were two books you created. Oh yeah, then the Matt catalog, mm-hmm. which is out of print, but um. Actually, I'm going to put a PDF of that catalog, which the Met made available oh, wow. on my website because it's hard to find on the Met website. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for talking to me about Tadanori. Thank you so much. It was really fun. And um, okay, great. Clear. I'll talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. bye.